All right, it is officially noon here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I am based. And so it is the occasion to say good afternoon or good morning or good evening, good night, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this edition of PON Live from the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. I'm Nicole Bryant. I'm the Managing Director here at the Program on Negotiation. And on behalf of all of the faculty, staff, and researchers, here at PON, it is a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this session today on Managing Conflict Mindfully. Um, and I'm joined today by a, a number of speakers and presenters. First and foremost, the author, um, Leonard Riskin. I'm going to be introducing them in just a second. But before I do that, let me explain a little bit about the format of today's session. Uh, as many of you know, because we have so many regular attendees at these PON Live events, uh, we've been very pleased to be uniting our community of faculty and scholars from both uh, at Harvard and uh, across uh, the world, indeed, over the course of these hour-long events for the past couple of years now. And it's so great to see so many participants in the chat letting us know uh, where they're coming in from. Every time you do this, I get ideas for my next vacation. So thank you uh, as ever. And now it's summer, so I'm kind of I'm kind of getting ready for that. Um, so thank you for tuning in with us. We're really delighted to have you here with us for the course of this hour. And of course, this session is being recorded. And as with all of our events, if you need to leave early or you have a friend who couldn't make it or you think that this would be uh, great information for a colleague, in just a couple of days, probably by the end of the week, you'll be able to go back to the PON events page where you registered and view this recording and share it and, uh, and make sure that you catch up on it. So no worries there. Um, as, as you're already doing, if you have any comments during the course of this event, we invite you to put them in the chat. We will do our best to monitor them. Um, however, if you have a question for our author or for any of our panelists, we would invite you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We will have about 20 minutes of a question and answer session at the conclusion of this presentation. Uh, and that allows us to just triage most effectively questions and group them together in case uh, some folks have uh, similar, um, similar ones. Thanks to the PON staff, of course, who does a lot of work uh, putting together these programs. We have had a very busy start to the summer, and we are delighted to be continuing our PON Live series uh, with all of you today. So uh, PON's Assistant Director, James Kerwin, our Events Coordinator, Diane Long, and our Program Associate, Riley Schretzel, who I think has worked about seven out of the last eight days. So we are delighted that he's still standing. And Riley, vacation is coming very soon, I promise. And thank you. All right, and without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our three panelists for today's session. First and foremost, of course, uh, the author of the book that's bringing us together, Leonard L. Riskin, the, a visiting professor of law at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law, as well as the Chesterfield Smith Professor of Law Emeritus at the University of Florida's Levin College of Law. He's joined today by Allison Carroll, a clinical professor and the co-director of the Center on Negotiation, Mediation, and Restorative Justice at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law, as well as uh, by PON's own Dan Shapiro, affiliate faculty here, associate professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and at McLean Hospital, and the director of the Harvard International Negotiation Program. I know that we are in for a wonderful discussion with these three today. So without further ado, I will turn over the virtual Zoom microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And I just want to start by saying to you and Dan, Diane, Riley, and James, and everyone at PON, how much we appreciate being with you all for this event to highlight Len's new book on behalf of the Center on Negotiation, Mediation, Restorative Justice at Northwestern. Um, and I thought I would just share with all of you joining us on the webinar or watching the recording later, just how excited Dan and I are to be a part of this event in preparing for today, I think, we decided that sort of our single most goal, most important goal for this is to get you all as excited about this book as we are. Um, we've had the good fortune to work with Len in a number of different capacities for the past 20 years and watch and listen as he has identified and discovered a lot of the concepts that he has pulled together in this book. I was a student of Len's 20 years ago and uh, learning about mindfulness in law school before I, any other law school had started integrating mindfulness into their curriculum and today have the pleasure of working with Len as a colleague at Northwestern where we've had the chance to collaborate on some curriculum, introducing many of these concepts to our students. 
Um, Dan, do you want to share a little bit about your working relationship with Len and maybe a little bit about the structure for today? That sounds perfect. So thank you, Allison. And it is an honor and a pleasure and totally awesome to be here with both of you, with Len, with you, Allison, all of you from around the world. I've known Len for about two decades. Uh, and from the moment that I read his work, I was inspired by it and truly, really invigorated and inspired. And we would met about two decades ago in passing at a conference or two. But it was Jen Morrow, this wonderful mediator from Chicago, who really connected us together and said, you two should teach a course together, given your very different uh, perspectives on negotiations. You should teach a course at Northwestern. And she, along with the Northwestern team, helped uh, create this course, helped us to create this course that we've been teaching for the past 15 or so years. And for me, it's been an incredible learning experience, learning alongside Len um, over these many years. Um, so I could keep going on and on, but let us move into the program. The structure of our program today is simple. Uh, Allison and I are going to explore with Len some of the major contributions of his new book. And we sort of see this as a mixture of an interview and a conversation. And then as Nicole had noted at 40 minutes or so after the hour, we're gonna turn the mic back to Nicole who will lead all of you in an audience Q&A so you can have the opportunity to ask Len your own questions and to learn from him directly. So with that, let me turn the mic back to you, Nick, I, I, Allison, yeah. Thanks so much, Dan, I appreciate it. Uh, so Len, I think it might be helpful for folks to understand really the presenting problem that motivated you to write this book. I mean, I think as we mentioned before, You've written on a number of these concepts individually over the years, but this is the first time you've really pulled it all together. So what were um, what was the presenting problem that motivated you to write the book? Before I answer you, I want to just respond to what Allison and, and Dan said a few minutes ago. It's my great pleasure to be working with you after all these years of working together in other settings. And thank you. And thanks to everyone involved. What was your question? I know. <laughs> So the presenting problem, why did I write this book? Um, the presenting problem is this. After uh, I've been studying negotiation and mediation and practicing and teaching and writing about it for a long, long time. Uh, and the publications of the PON have been very uh, helpful, very, very helpful and very influential and so forth. Um, what I have noticed, and you probably all noticed this, is that even people who are very well trained in negotiation and have read everything and have a lot of experience will, from time to time, really mess up a particular negotiation or mediation. And the same thing applies in almost any field. So it's not, we're, we're focusing on negotiation, but we're also talking about any kind of a difficult situation same thing happens to experts from time to time. And I started thinking about, well, why is that? Uh, is it something like a baseball? Good hitters in baseball also only have three, 350 batting averages. Why don't they get hits all the time? Um, so that's the presenting problem. And I appreciate the mistakes that negotiators make cause terrible consequences at every level in the world, right? No, absolutely. And I, I think it's really refreshing to hear you talk about the struggles of implementing things. Um, you used the baseball example. Someone in chat said, yeah, even LeBron has a bad game. Uh, so I appreciated that. That seems to resonate with folks. Um, and you have done a really nice job of succinctly describing what some of the obstacles are for um, those of us who've been studying this and people who are new to some of the material um, to being successful in negotiating or in any type of difficult interaction. Would you um, go a little bit further and describe what those obstacles were? Yeah, sure. So let me say that there are many, many causes for uh, making errors in negotiation or in doing anything else, but I've identified five obstacles in particular, which seem to affect lots of people. And would you, Allison, uh, put up the slide for the obstacles? And so I'll tell you the way I got to this list. First, I'll tell you the list, 
and how I developed it. Sometimes we make mistakes in the way we're thinking. So we think too fast. We have habitual ways of thinking, of sizing up people, sizing up situations, deciding what to do. And sometimes it's completely automatic. Um, and it's as if we're not really thinking. Daniel Kahneman calls that fast thinking. Uh, and sometimes it is. And, but the point is, we do a lot of things automatically based on our habits. Another cause can be, and this is easy to see in, in a negotiation, and I'm assuming that almost everybody on this call has some background in negotiation. Um, one of the uh, key contributions of the program on negotiation is to, was to produce and popularize the idea of interests, um, meaning, what do people in a negotiation really care about and why, rather than the position which might be, you owe me $100,000. Um, the idea is, what I want to suggest is, often when we're in difficult situations, we are think, and in, even when we're all alone, we're not doing anything, we can be very uh, centered on ourselves and our own concerns, so much so that we can't tune in or aren't interested in the core, con the interests or other concerns of the other people. We're sort of blinded to them. Another thing would be we are experiencing strong emotions and we can't manage them. So if these are strong negative emotions or even strong positive emotions, we could fall in love with somebody on the other side of the table. We can't think uh, well or clearly. Then sometimes there are some people who don't have adequate social skills. So in that situation, these people might know what to do. I know how to, it could be anything. It could be proposing for marriage. It could be making an offer in a negotiation. Almost any kind of uh, task. You know what to do, you know what to say, but you don't know how to say it in a way that seems genuine. We, we all know people who have this problem and maybe most of us have from time to time found ourselves in that situation. And last is that we can't adequately manage our awareness or focus. So we're not able to pay attention as much as we should to what's actually going on in the negotiation, to what the other person is saying, to what the other person is probably feeling, the emotions, as well as what we're thinking and the emotions that we're experiencing, and keeping in mind the actual substance of the transaction we're trying to deal with here. There's all that. It's a lot to, and, and uh, we all have trouble with that sometimes, and some of us have more trouble than others. And these five obstacles also interact with one another. They potentiate, as physicians say, one another. So that's, that's the quick uh, review. So I, it, it's a, they're complex in the way that they interact with each other. And I know we don't have time for you to go through that complexity or all of the obstacles in any more depth. But one of the things you do so nicely in the book is not only use uh, the stories with the characters, Pedro and Billy of the business relationship um, or Laura and her um, negotiation partnerships, uh, partners at her law firm, but you share personal experiences facing these obstacles. Um, and I was wondering if you had a story either that's in the book or not in the book um, that might uh, dem uh, highlight how some of these obstacles come up, maybe um, just one of them or a few of them since they interact. And I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, uh, Diane, I think put into chat what the five obstacles are for the audience. So if you're looking for those, um, you can go to chat for that. Is that okay, Len? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that, so a story that it helps us understand these obstacles. Well, so it's, uh, it's, this is a story that's not in the book. It's a true story. I'm disguising the identities of the 
people involved except my own, um, in which I was doing a mediation. And uh, for various reasons, I was up very late the night before actually working on the phone with the lawyers in this case before we mediated. And so I was very tired when this started the next morning. I had to drive to get there and so forth. Um, and I started realizing as we began the process that I really disliked one of the parties. Now I know, and you know I know, but you're not supposed to be thinking that kind of stuff in a mediation. You're, the mediator is supposed to help people. Uh, and then as we went on, I was also a little frightened of him. And as we went on, I realized I really liked the party on the other side, both males. I was having a mental bromance with this guy on the other side, thinking we could be great friends. And meanwhile, while I'm having those thoughts, I'm not focusing. So I was so focused on myself um, that I wasn't able for a while to pay attention. That caused anxiety and the anxiety uh, made everything worse. It made it harder for me to focus and really start listening to them because I was listening so much to myself. Um, and then because I, I knew all about mindfulness and mediation and negotiation at that time. And I was listening to my the voices in my head, which you'll I'll, t I'll say later come from these parts of the personality from internal family systems. Uh, and they were saying, one of them was saying, do they like me? You know, what, what do they think about me? Meanwhile, they're talking. Okay, they're talking and their lawyers are talking and it's all kinds of emotions floating around. I'm thinking about whether they like me. Do they think, another voice is saying, do they think you're a good mediator? You know, you have a big rep, but you really write about mediation more than you actually do it. And maybe you shouldn't do it at all. This other voice saying, why are you doing this? You don't know how to mediate, really. So there's this, this voice saying, you're not actually very competent at this. Why do you do it? Why don't you go back to your office and write footnotes? That's what you're really good at. So I have these voices running around in my head. Meanwhile, I'm listening to them. I'm feeling awful about myself, and I'm not listening to the actual conversation that's going on in the room. And of course, after a while, I realized that and was able to pull it together and it had an okay result. Um, but the point is, I was not there. And I think all of, maybe I had the social skills needed, but I really didn't know what to do, or I thought I didn't know what to do. That was the other voice saying, the voice that was that was uh, calling me incompetent was also saying, you have no idea what to do. You have no idea. You're the mediator. Why are you the mediator? Why did they hire me? I knew why they hired me. One of the parties wanted to hire me because he thought they could push me around. So that's my little story. That's true. And I'm seeing in chat a lot when people saying, I can totally relate, um, a same, thank you for sharing this. Uh, and I think it is one of the unique things about your writing and one of the things that is, I think I mentioned earlier, refreshing, but also just reassuring um, when you're learning these skills and techniques that when you don't do it right, you think you're a failure and maybe I shouldn't be a part of this at all. Um, can you just share a little bit with us about what it was like to reflect on your personal experiences and then write so candidly about them in this book and your previous articles? People seem to really appreciate it. That's what they're saying in chat. So, so this, this um, kind of writing seemed to come very naturally to me. Um, and part of it was that the other thing I was doing before 
I got very into mediation and so forth was writing personal essays uh, for popular, for magazines and newspapers um, that were designed, that were really were very funny, but they're also designed to uh, uncover some really difficult experiences in my life, but, but make them funny. So that was natural. The other thing is I thought I had more to teach using uh, my own failures than my own successes. Uh, I could say, well, look what I did. I did this wrong and this wrong and this wrong. Here's what I should have done if I were, if I had been able. Um, the other thing is I've been uncomfortable about bragging about successes and saying, oh, I was in this terrible, terrible situation and people were blah, blah, this and, and I saved it. I saved it and look what I did and you should do the same kind of thing when you're in that kind of a situation, look at me. Um, also, I probably didn't have very many of those kind of spectacular or even modest successes. I'm trying to make believe that I'm very humble, right? I don't want to brag. So I want to, I'd like to have a reputation for, mm, reputation for humility. Now I'm trying to be funny, okay? Um, so, so that's sort of how I got into this. And it's been easy for me. I realize that m for most people, it's not easy to reveal uh, failures or unwise or inappropriate behavior. I haven't told, I, I mean, I haven't told the really bad things I've done in writing, okay? But that, so that's the story. And I think I can teach more by my failures. I learn more from my failures than I, I do from my successes. And I suspect that's true for a lot of people, even though a lot, well, a lot of people don't like to talk about it, this sort of thing with, with others. And the other thing along with it is I've always been very, very, very interested in psychology and why people behave as they do. Um, in addition to what they say about why they behaved the way they did. I'm interested in what's beneath that. I've always, I've always been. So that's my story. Do you want to say anything more about your, I think it's interesting how very, very early on in your career, psychology was an interest of yours and really has informed um, your scholarship over the years. Um, so before we sort of go into what some of the strategies and solutions are for addressing these obstacles, would you share a little bit about um, your interest in psychology and how it has uh, influenced some of your work over the years in this book in particular? Yeah, sure. I, I um, almost, I majored in psychology as an undergraduate, almost went to graduate school, but at the time I thought it would not be healthy for me because I was already too introspective. Um, so, but I, so I went to law school and uh, continued, continued that interest. Um, and my, I guess I kept studying and learning more about psychology in different forms. And I began to use it in my writing. And I started writing about using humanistic psychology from working with uh, Jack Himmelstein and Gary Friedman, who've done a lot of programs at the PON um, uh, for many years. And that's my first writing on mediation was introducing hum humanistic psychology. I mean, I don't know if how many people are, have gone to law school, but when I went to law school, uh, or shortly after that, all the leading law schools had psychiatrists on their full-time faculty who were not lawyers. Most of them were psychoanalysts. Now I'm guessing that nobody has psychoanalysts on the on a law school faculty. I'm, I am aware of one, but so the the psychology that students get in law school is quite different from, uh, say, humanistic psychology. 
Um, but I also used, uh, relied on research and so forth. And gradually, um, I became a little more disciplined about what I was writing and relied more on research, um, but tried to, when I, um, when I got really interested in mindfulness is when I began to explore a Buddhist psychology and started using that in my writing about mindfulness. And there is a, a considerable overlap between Buddhist psychology and some schools of Western psychology, but it, it's different and it does help explain mindfulness and its uses in a different way than most people using most forms of Western psychology can do. So I, I just continued with that sort of thing. And then mo most recently, uh, 10 years ago, I discovered internal family systems at Harvard Law School, where when I was invited to give a talk on a program sponsored by the Harvard Negotiation Law Review on the negotiation within, meaning the, what's going on in, in, in your head when you're negotiating. And David Hoffman, uh, who many of you know, teaches and researches at Harvard, old friend and colleague of mine, gave a talk about internal family systems. And I was really interested and we went out for coffee and David said, you have to get into this. And that's how I started. Uh, although I had some inkling about it before, but literally had forgotten. I'd learned about it before, but forgot. How's that? How's that for a big confession, right? Um, so, and th then I've been enchanted with internal family systems since 2011 or maybe 2010. Uh, and I've started writing and been writing. I've written about it before, but this is the, you know, as, as you said, Allison, the first time I've connected and tried to integrate uh, negotiation and mindfulness and, and internal family systems. And I always have a concern about whether I'm um, going deeper than most people want to read. Uh, and let, and maybe it, I'll jump in right here for a moment, not to cut you off, but to, put, to even to dig deeper into your mind as well. First of all, uh, I, I was struck by one of the chat comments that already noticed your humility. And I agree with that completely. I also think another major attribute that I admire about your work and you is courage. So I remember, and we were talking about this, one of the first, actually, I think it was the first time that we taught a program at Northwestern 15 years ago. Mindfulness had been obviously studied for you know centuries, but it hadn't hit the public uh, cultures around the world very much. At the, we, at the close of our first day, we had done a full day, I'm sure you recall this. We had done a full first day on interest-based negotiation. And at the close of the day with these 45, you know, fairly, my sense, conservative uh, lawyers from Chicago, <laughs> you say, we're going to close the day with a loving kindness meditation. <laughs> and half the group went, this is fascinating. And the other half went, what the heck is this? And you just said, you know what? This is powerful stuff. Let's explore it together. Let's see what this is about. And it took courage, and I think it takes courage. And one of the things that I love about your work, about your book, about you more generally, is that you see negotiation holistically. It's about the whole human that is involved. Yes, the deal was important in that mediation you talked about, but you were also self-aware enough to realize and introspective enough to realize there's a lot more than just that deal that is affecting the deal. Mm -hmm. And I've also been struck by the extent to which you have drawn on theories from outside the field of negotiation to help feel, fill the gap in the field of negotiation. And you've alluded to this already. You've talked about mindfulness as one of the things you talk about in your book, one of the major theories and, and practical tools. But I'd love if you could explain more about IFS, because I, I suspect some of the people who are listening today know exactly what IFS is. Others, this might be the first time they've ever heard of this concept. And as a psychologist, this 
concept of IFS, this theory has become a really big deal in the field of, of uh, psychology. And you have taken a lead in bringing this to the field of negotiation. For those of us who may not know that much about it, what is internal family systems in its simplest form so that you know, we can catch the essence of it? Sure, it's um, a theory of the mind and an approach to psychotherapy, um, which is based on these ideas that with, in our, I'm using the word psyche because nobody really knows what that means, or we could say our minds. Um, there are two kinds of entities. Uh, there's a self, which I'll come back to in, in a moment. And then there are, there's one self and there's a whole bunch of things that are called parts, which are the same thing as what psychologists have called subpersonalities for quite a while. And each of these, oh, so these parts and the self, the self is like the soul, uh, more or less. It's something uh, mm, that is not biased in favor of the person. So myself doesn't favor me over you. My parts, most of them do favor me over you. So the parts are like little people inside of us. Uh, and they're like little people in the sense that they have uh, an age. They were created when, when the person was a certain age. They have biases. They have prejudices. They have preferences. They have values. They have fears. They have hopes. They have dreams. And they're all trying to help the person. So I have a part that is uh, very, very generous and a part that's pretty stingy. Uh, and it, there's a, a polarization there, and many of our parts have have exact opposite parts. Uh, and the parts um, can do the kinds of things that people can do. The parts can negotiate with one another. Uh, sometimes the self can mediate. I mean, I mean literally that you learn how to do that uh, in internal family systems training. Um, and the self and the parts interact as a system. And you're all probably familiar with the idea of family a systems therapy in which a psychotherapist looks at the patient in the context of that person's actual human family. Um, so Dick Schwartz, who is the creator of internal family systems, who has, by the way, lots of connections with both of our universities, is, has an appointment in, uh, at Harvard Medical School now and taught for many years at Northwestern. Um, his, uh, the reason he called it internal family systems is that he regards the self and the parts as functioning the way an actual human family would function which is system, but I mean, within a certain perspective, you can look at most families as, as a system comparable in some ways to a system within an organization uh, and so forth. So that's, that's the basic idea. And he's, oh, I'm gonna so stop. Say, so there's the self, that's compassionate, it's pure, it's always well-intentioned, and then you have all these different parts, which are sub-personalities. Could you share with us an example of how you've seen IFS effective within the negotiation context, whether that's your, a personal example or any, anything? Yeah, just how does this actually work? Yeah, practically. Well, there are you know, lots of examples, but just to... Uh, yeah, we're running a little short on time. So let me give you just a simple uh, kind of example. Uh, this is We've got time, Len. We've got time. You're good. Okay, there's a part of me saying, hurry up. Yeah, we're <laughs> no. at home now. People have had enough of this, right? So uh, many years ago, before I moved to the University of Florida, I was there giving a talk on, I don't know, mediation or 
something. And on the same day, it happened that Chief Justice Rehnquist of the US Supreme Court was also, was giving a separate talk later. After this, there was a symposium. Later, he's giving a talk. So I was invited as a guest. And I, when I went into the room where he was giving his talk, Justice Rehnquist was the only person in the room. So he was standing at the podium, messing around with his mic. And um, I hear a voice in my head saying, go talk to him, go talk to him. And that was my mother. It's called an introject. It's not exactly my mother, but uh, Dick Schwartz in IFS calls that uh, an introject, it means, but it was, I was thinking of my, my mother was saying that to me in my head, go talk to him. And I say back, I don't know what to say. And she said, go talk to him. He's a very wise man. You ask him for advice about something. And I said, I was, so I'm having this conversation with my mother and I was able to resist. Uh, I didn't go and talk to him because I really didn't know what to say. And I wasn't, in, I didn't, anyway, so that's just one simple uh, kind of example. But if we go back to the case I was describing, the mediation that I did, um, I this was before I really knew about internal family systems, but I, I, I think I can uh, say something about how my certain of my parts uh, affected me uh, or were arguing to me about what I should do or what I should think. So there was one part who is uh, is frightened, tends to be frightened, and and is frightened of this one of the uh, parties because he was very big and strong and aggressive. Now, don't tell anybody I said this, but I tend to be a little bit insecure around people like that. Part of me is a sissy, is afraid I'll get beaten up. There's another part that is condemning this person because of his, what I assume to be his values. He was uh, representing very rich people and doing something that I considered uh, not right. Okay, so that's the other voice saying this guy's a bum. Then I had another voice saying that is really interested in having in, in having friends. It's safer if I have friends in the world. Uh, I don't have enough friends or this other party in the case was a uh, kind of person I'd like to be friends with. So this other voice is saying, hey, try to become friends with this guy sometime. And then I then there's a mediator part in me and saying, you can't do that. And finally, so this part that's a mediator comes out and says, hey, your job is to help these people, not to think about whether you like them or don't like them or whether they like you or don't like you. Um, the, so that's one, I don't know if that's, is that along the lines of what you're looking for? Yeah. Absolutely. I, 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 what I hear is that there's this symphony going on in our minds. Sometimes it's a circus that's going on in our minds. And most of us as negotiators or mediators are unaware of that mere fact. And right. what, what I see your book doing, in a sense, is helping people to become more aware of all of these inner uh, dynamics. That's probably not the right word, but this inner world so that you can. And, and then how do you use that inner world to be as effective externally as possible. Is that fair? Yeah, it's fair. It's, al it's also so you can make, mm, you can achieve some freedom from these inner voices if you're aware of them. Mm -hmm. If you're not aware of them or aren't, or if you start believing them. So that's why the part of why the subtitle of the book is don't believe everything you think, because if you start paying attention to the voices in your head, you'll realize you don't believe a lot of thoughts that come into your mind. Um, and you can still be influenced by them. Uh, be some of this is subconscious, some of what's going on. And uh, so the idea of IFS is to become very aware of these parts and their needs. See, the parts have needs. They are like people, they're all, they all want to be useful to the person. Some of them are quite frightened and want to protect the person, say me, from 
being injured or damaged or hurt in some way, and they don't trust the self because the self doesn't prefer me to anybody else. So um, in, in fact, when you start working with this, it's not as a complex and uh, as it might sound, and it's not as bizarre as it might sound to some uh, listeners who are not familiar uh, with this way of thinking. The fact is that this approach to psychotherapy and to understanding the mind has lots of predecessors. This isn't something that uh, Dick Schwartz uh, dreamed up. He did dream it up on his own, I should say, in the sense that he learned all this from his patients. But there was a there were a lot of precursors, including uh, Carl Jung, for example, and um, uh, there is a uh, there was an Italian psychoanalyst named Roberto Assagioli who developed something called psychosynthesis. About his book was published, I think, in 1969. And it's very, very similar to internal family systems in terms of the structure. And for those of you who've been in mediation for a while, it had a period of great influence in mediation in the United States. And uh, I think in, in Germany and Austria as well, it was brought in by uh, people I've mentioned before, uh, Gary Friedman and Jack Himmelstein. They began teaching um, what's called psychosynthesis as part of their mediation training. Uh, and I learned that, but I forgot it. So I, then when I heard about internal family systems, oh no, anyway, I didn't really forget it, but I hadn't used it for all these years. Um, so these things go around. It's not really a very weird idea if you've been involved in psychology and interested in, in psychology. Uh, for some people who haven't been involved or interested, it might sound awfully bizarre. The fact is, it's you can do these things as you learn in internal family systems. You can have a conversation with your frightened part and find out why they're frightened. And so I had a Another, another situation, which I won't get into, but in which I was negotiating and I was extremely stingy with a person with whom I was negotiating, who was a, a person of much less affluence than I, uh, a poor person. And I was not, I was saving $3 or something very small to me, but big to him. Uh, because there was a part of me that sank, that I inherited from particular people in my uh, family saying, you're not made of money, you know, get the best price you can, don't worry about that other person. So that was a part. I could talk to that part if I had known, if I had been alert and ask, what, what's wrong? What are you afraid of? Why, why are you doing this? And the part would say, because I'm afraid you'll spend all your money and then you'll be destitute. And then I could explain, I'm oversimplifying dramatically here, I could explain to that part, actually, I have enough money. You know, my wife and I have had good jobs for a long time. We've saved enough money. And it's, it's also $3. Now, in this case, I didn't do that. I saved the $3. Uh, and I'm, so I'm humiliated by the fact that I did that, and I've written about it a lot. So this goes back to Allison's uh, earlier question, but but that's the idea. It's it's it. This you don't have to believe that these parts are real, but if you treat them as real, you can work with them as if they were actual people. Um, and there, there's a part of, I think, both Alison and myself right now that wants to continue this dialogue with you. <laughs> and there's another part that recognizes we promised Q&A from the audience as well. Perfect. Um, but, but this has been phenomenal. And I love the level of depth that you brought our conversation 
uh, because your book brings the reader to that same level of depth with clarity and with prescriptive direction as well. Uh, but Allison, any closing remarks just before we turn it back to Nicole? Well, I'll just um, I reiterate what you're saying about this book, that it not only contextualizes what is happening that creates those obstacles, but recognizing those parts. And I love what you just said, Len, you don't even have to believe them, but if you treat them as real, then you can interact with them so that you can overcome those obstacles. So it's not just the awareness. So you have to have the awareness, but it's once you have the awareness, it's doing something about it that provides a solution to these obstacles. And it's just, um, it's very powerful for so many of us that love the theories and concepts we've been learning for years from PON to now have this additional set of tools to help us just put those theories um, into practice more effectively. Um, but let's bring Nicole back on uh, to walk us through some of the questions that we've gotten in chat and in the Q&A, but obviously folks keep adding them in there um, if you like as well. Nicole, welcome back. Yeah, happy to, to still be here. Um, this, this is going to be an excruciating exercise to, to distill all of the questions, and I know we're going to get more, so I will apologize in advance because there is no way we're going to be able to treat everything, but I'm going to take the first um, block of, of questions, um, which are I think really are around mindfulness and around how, you know, Len, it sounds like you are already someone with a mindfulness practice. Um, you know, how you can make sure that you're holding on to these tenants in as a mediator or in negotiations, but also for people who are new to mindfulness um, and may not have a practice, how they can kind of, you know, develop the skills or use the skills that you're that you are talking about in their everyday work and to and to take be able to take that step back and um, and understand what's happening in the moment. Well, it, it, it's a great question. Um, and I could give a very, very long answer, but I won't. Um, the short answer is uh, like the joke about somebody walking down the street asking, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is uh, practice, you know, thinking that person's a musician. Um, but the idea is you have to practice mindfulness. Uh, some people have it naturally, but not very many. The idea is to be able to be present or to be a, aware of your moment-to-moment -moment experience as you're experiencing it without judgment or evaluation or assessment. So the idea is to be, a, and this is hard for people to do. It's hard for anyone to do, and our basic human nature makes it hard uh, and we we get distracted by the same factors the same obstacles that i just talked about that limit our ability to do anything in the world also limit our ability to be mindful mindfulness is the cure and uh it's also vulnerable uh, to these same obstacles. So what most people do, if you want to get into it, is begin practicing, which you can do in many ways. There are many, many training programs available every place in, uh, in the U.S. and, and uh, also online, any place you can get all kinds of training. Then there are residential facilities. There are lots of books. There are lots of conferences. It helps generally if you can do this with other people because it becomes very hard. What, what almost always happens to new people who are new at mindfulness. I've been teaching mindfulness, by the way, since about 1989 in, in a community in Columbia, Missouri, where I lived, and also in law schools uh, about when Allison started law school. Um, so there are all kinds of online opportunities for doing it, but what happens to almost everyone, the first instruction is close your eyes or close them halfway. And in fact, we could just try this for a second. Bring your attention to the sensations of breathing. Say, watch, observing your belly rise and fall as you inhale and exhale. Keep your attention there. If 
When you notice your mind has wandered, bring it back. I'm gonna stop because of the shortness of time, but the idea is if we would have done that for two minutes, uh, er, most of the people on this Zoom event who hadn't done this before would say, I can't do that. It's impossible because there's all this stuff buzzing around in my head. And many people then quit. They don't try it because they say, I, I can't do it. Well, the truth is everybody has that problem. And what you're trying to do is not learn to focus on your breath so much as learn to pay attention what's, to what's actually happening in your awareness. And what's actually happening in your awareness is your mind is jumping around while you're trying to observe your breath. And that's, that is so that it's part of what you're trying to learn to do. So the idea is practice over and over. Best to work with a teacher. It's best to do this with other people. For those of you who are lawyers, uh, there is something called the Mindfulness in Law Society, uh, which you can find online, which has uh, chapters all over the US and uh, I think two big, big chapters in Europe, one in Latin America, New Zealand, and a couple of other places. Uh, so uh, that's a group that will uh, make clearer how all this applies to lawyers and lawyering in law school. But the truth is mindfulness practice has the same benefits for anyone. Uh, maybe lawyers and law students suffer more from stress than most other people do. Um, and there are, you know, there are details of the differences, but so something, something like that, and you have to stick with it uh, and do the best you can. That's great. Thank you so much, Lennon. Um, I will put this in the chat. I was reminded of um, PON's last Great Negotiator Award, which went to Christiana Figueres, who was the architect of the Paris Climate Peace Accords and who also credits mindfulness with her success in getting all of the parties at the COP to what was widely you know, regarded as the as the most important climate agreement at that time. So I'll put the link in the chat in case people are- Oh, well, that's great. Out. Um, yeah. Um, we have so many questions. I, a number of them are, are on, once we've seen these obstacles, we understand them, we know what they are, how do we, how do we get past them? And I know that they're, they are different, um, but what is the sort of next step to make that practical leap um, into improving? Well, um, in recent years, there, there, has, there have developed some resources that are particularly good at helping you um, move or, or um, apply mindfulness, not only when you're sitting in meditation, uh, but also in daily life. Um, there has been a tendency in the mindfulness teacher community in the United States until recently to emphasize long periods of meditation, at least 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, and the more you do, the better, the more you're learning. Recently, there, and there's been some research showing that certain kinds of very brief mindfulness activities that you do many times a day, like a short pause, for example, can be more effective and more helpful than long periods of, of meditation. Um, there, particularly, there's there's a book called um, uh, Craving something about uh, Judson Brewer, B R E W E R, uh, Unwinding Anxiety, and he has another book about craving, uh, in which he uh, explains his great deal of research at, at Brown Medical School uh, on this. Uh, so there are some short things you can do, like taking a, a brief pause when you just, you are in some situation and you suddenly have no idea what to do and you're frightened and you're confused. And um, there are specific exercises. I want to recommend one other specific exercise called RAIN, R-A-I-N, it's the acronym. 
uh, developed uh, most um, helpfully by Tara Brock, T-A-R-A-B-R-A-C-H, who has about five books out and a wonderful website. These are specific techniques you can use to when you're getting in trouble, you're getting too anxious, you're getting overwhelmed with emotions or something, or too concerned about yourself. Um, but what's important to understand is you're never going to be able to manage all this stuff all the time. Uh, so the idea is to get better and better at it. And the more you practice, the more some of these particular short techniques become habits. They can actually replace, to some extent, other habits. Like they've used these uh, techniques on uh, helping people quit smoking or alcohol to help a group of physicians manage their anxiety, which Brewer calls a habit. And, and we, many of us have the habit of feeling anxious a lot. So um, this is not exactly, for most of us, a panacea. Uh, but it can help us suffer less. The basic problem that Buddhist psychology uh, addresses is that there's a lot of suffering in all of our lives, and there doesn't need to be as much. And that suffering arises from wanting things to be different than the way they are, and craving, uh, and not getting what you want. So that's a long, uh, long answer. Uh, but my experience is the more you practice and the more diligence you use, the uh, better able you become to manage these kinds of uh, distractions and feel better and perform better. But everyone has lapses. Um, Len, so that's I was even thinking about the, the three-day program that we run, and your notion was let's not just teach mindfulness or tools of awareness in a single block on day one or day two or day three, let's integrate it throughout. So there are 20 yeah. or 30-minute segments throughout three days where the student starts to build a habit, or at least the beginnings of a potential habit. Yes. No, that, that's right. That's what we're trying for. And in three days, we're trying to combine it with with negotiation. So that's a, that's, it's a lot. Um, and also doing the same thing with internal family systems. And I do want to say something about the internal family systems. What I'm trying to do also is to connect elements in negotiation, like interests or core concerns with particular parts of the person. When I say it's my interest, is it my interest or is it the interest of my such and such a part? Anyway, sorry, back to mindfulness. Um, Len, I have I have a question, and then I think we're probably going to be coming to the conclusion of the questions. I know, everyone, you're going to need to read the book and then continue to engage with Len, just given the time that we have. But I guess the question can be best summarized as, if you're bringing parties into this approach, to what extent and how do you train them on the techniques that you're using? How are you able to do that in the context of a mediation to let them know sort of how this is working? Are you explicit about it or not um, uh, in using internal family systems, in, in using mindfulness, um, not only for yourself as the mediator, but also for the, for the parties? Well, it depends a lot on who the people are. Um, with, you know, take the average person, not much about mindfulness. Um, but if you take people who have some interest in it already, uh, or in something similar to it, sometimes you can introduce it and some people will, will like it or just change it into a period of silence, for example, instead of, instead of saying, oh, this is a Buddhist uh, practice, let's have a moment of silence, notice your breath or something like that. Um, and with IFS, there are ways to use IFS without saying you're using IFS. So uh, David Hoffman, whom I mentioned before, uh, has written about the idea of asking, for example, is there a part of you that thinks this? 
And is there a part of you that thinks that? So he's not, and everybody, not, most people understand that. So he's using IFS, but he's not saying, oh, there's this IFS and here are the beliefs and it sounds weird, but don't worry, it really works. So there are ways to draw on it. And the other thing is, if you're working with people who are in either of these fields or familiar, you can use it explicitly, but otherwise it's, it's probably best uh, not to. Um, so you have to just make a judgment about uh, every situation, every moment, which is in a way the, you know, the essence of mindfulness rather than, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, use this stuff because people will freak out. It's just notice what's going on right now with these two people is sitting in the mediation room. And can you draw on those? Or the other thing that is very common among psychotherapists and mediators who've been trained in IFS or trained in psychosynthesis uh, is that while they're working with uh, people, they're noticing or imagining what kind of parts are active within each of these people without saying anything about it, but maybe trying to speak to or influence the parts, knowing something about what the parts are worried about. So one part is worried about very much about not having enough money or something like that to maybe address that in, in some way. So that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm sorry that we don't have more time. I appreciate um, your time, Len, and yours, Allison and Dan's. Um, thank you to the three of you for being here. Um, and thank you to all of our participants. We had over 700 people uh, at one point. So really great uh, to convene together. Um, and we will look forward to seeing our participants at a future PON Live or maybe one of our trainings uh, in Cambridge or online. So our next PON Live event is on July 12th. We're taking a little uh, beginning of July break um, on polarities. Uh, and we look forward to seeing so many of you here then or perhaps at one of our regularly scheduled training sessions. Thank you again uh, to our author and panelists and thanks to all of our participants for joining us today. We wish you a very pleasant rest of your week. Thank you so much. And thanks. I'm thanking everybody without naming them. Thank you so much for <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.